so we had never, so I've never really had a chance to get back. To oh, okay. Her and speak to her one to one, like well, what to you find mean? out exactly, right, exactly how. how See, the yeah. Virginia Satir jumps in my head. How specifically have you changed? Right, you know, exactly. it's like. You know, so, I mean, I would because change could, you know, and here's here's the here's the thing. I'll already start talking about this. Little, you know, more advanced thing, but when somebody says change, you want to really hold back on, you know, assuming which way that goes. Right. It could be in a positive direction or it might have been in a direction she didn't want. And from what you were saying, I had no idea, first of all, whether you were talking about a personal thing or just making something up. So I'm, I'm waiting for the rest of the story. And that was what, where my head went as a hypnotist is right. change, how did she change? Right. That's right. very non-judgmental. It doesn't lead it in a direction. And in this case, if you were my client and you said that, that's exactly what I would say. Right. How did she change? Exactly. Yeah. And if she said, well, I don't know, I didn't get a chance to talk to her. Well, I guess we can't discuss that then. I don't know. But it, then I get the impression it must have been good. Because no, if she it told was you negative. she... No, oh, it was a negative. negative and I don't know how do you know it was a negative? Specifically how negative it was. Because but she, she said... Was mortified. She was mortified. She was mortified. And you weren't in the room when this happened? No, I was in the room. But I was talking... Okay, so I was talking to... A purse. Okay, I was talking to this woman, and she was, and I mentioned hypnosis that we have the hypnosis center, and she's like, "Well, you're not, you don't do that, do you?" Because oh, this was just a conversation, right? Because she said, "You know, I, I don't believe in in uh, hypnotism." She said, "I don't believe in hypnosis." She said, "Because I had an aunt that had." Oh, she. Has. So now we're third person so information here. Yeah. Who yeah. Um, underwent something with hypnosis and. She changed for the negative. Yeah. Is what I was so talking. what did you say to this lady when she said that? I was. J I didn't have a chance to really go back to her because once again there were ten other people that were in the room staring, and because some of the people like hypnosis, of, and to hear her say that. So other people heard her say. See, this is where people get misconceptions exactly. right there. There's exactly. an example. Right. So let's use that as a scenario because that's one I've never heard. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it was. First of all, it's very rare that someone's going to say that they know someone who had a bad experience with right. hypnosis. That right there is a red flag to me. Right. Of It could be a number of things, but my first thought is the hypnotist was an idiot and didn't know what he was doing, or she. Right. I just went to the male first because I'm a girl. <laughs> Not you know to be sexist, but we're biased to our own sex. Come on, let's face it. Um, so if somebody actually said that, you know, if you were, sh they were sitting in your chair, they're here because they say they want you to hypnotize them, and now they're saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm really nervous because I had an aunt that, this, just what she said. How do you imagine you might answer that? If you had time to plan ahead. Well, not everybody's uh, uh, idea is the same, you know. I, I think the difference is uh, the aunt, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Hypnosis as a professional. Um, but to address that specific concern, and you're about to hypnotize the person, this is this is what we're talking about in the pre-talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. The misconceptions you have to clear yeah, them up. You have to clear them up. So if the misconception here, okay. So let me simplify what that misconception is, and I may may not be 100 percent accurate, but <coughs> but to me, the misconception if somebody said what you just said to me, and I'm getting ready to hypnotize them. What I have to clear up, that's what a misconception is. You have to clear it up before you start the induction or else it's going to be still there. Right. What I have to clear up is the perception that hypnosis can mess somebody up and make, have negative effect. That's the, that's the pure essence of what you were telling me. Right. That person thinks that hypnosis can, can mess you up. Right. So I have to clear that up. How do I clear that up? With credibility. I say, the first thing I'm going to say, whether it's true or not, <laughs> And by the way, in the pre-talk, you can make things up, as long as it's not outrageous and as long as it's in designed to help your client. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think this is true. But, you know, when you first start, I was told this, and it, it was very, very nice to hear, that when you first start, and being an actor helped, you know, mm -hmm. but seriously, um, you don't have a lot of experiences to draw from yet. Not real ones for yourself. So it's okay to borrow them from other people. So here's what you can do with that. You can say, you know, I haven't been doing this very long, but I have a lot of respect for all of the people I've met in this field, and I've been studying it for a while now. And what I have uh, studied and read through all the centuries, you know, hypnosis is a very positive experience. And that tells me that whoever hypnotized your aunt, uh, and I can't know for sure, but that tells me that maybe they were just very unskilled, 
or maybe uh, I don't know exactly what happened because she's not here to tell me. I would love to hear about it. But in you know all the reading and all the studies I've done, there's never been uh, I've never heard of that. So what I want to tell you is, and then I'd go on to explain more about hypnosis. But I got to get past that thought. I got to got to get them to understand that maybe the person wasn't skilled, or maybe your aunt had some other problems that that person wasn't equipped to deal with, or something. But I've really got to get. That's a tough one too. Because if they think it messed somebody up, that's their first-hand knowledge of, of someone in their family. It's important. And if that's still lingering in the background, and, and that's the first time I've heard something like that, so I'd have to really think about it. Yeah. And, um, and I'll add the fact that she's Christian. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so that really takes in, I mean, she was just like blown out of the water that I would even, because I'm Does Christian. she think that hypno, now that's another misconception. Right. Remember we started on that yesterday and a little I think bit. it was great that you were reading the passage. Yes, yes. That's where I would go with somebody with exactly, that misconception. Exactly, yeah, exactly. absolutely. And I didn't really even have a chance to, to work with her to help yeah, her sure. understand that, I mean, that we go into, in and out of hypnosis all the time. Yeah. You know, so. But, but again, that, that information may not be relevant until you clear up that other <laughs> thing. You know, you, you can sit there and try to sell hypnosis to somebody, but if they, if they think it's dangerous, right. that's important. Right. Now, she probably wouldn't come to you for a session, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. But if somebody came in and said, see, I've never even heard, I would question that. First right. of all, I question the validity even of that. Might have given her aunt a reason to be more of a... Right. Yeah. You know, the word, you know the word I was about to say. Yeah, I, I, I have another one. Uh, a not nice person. <laughs> my mom told me. Your no, mom really told you. Oh, when you were a kid. That, yeah, you know, your Uncle Ron okay. was listening to a self-hypnosis tape. Okay. And Again, third hand. His roommate couldn't wake him up, mm -hmm. so his roommate had to go find a hypnotist to come in and wake mm -hmm. him up. And that worked. And that worked. Okay. So Uncle Ron had a story there, wasn't, didn't he, that he told some people. and I don't know what his yeah. version of the story was that got translated that way, but yeah, that's a pretty silly story. <laughs> what do you think about that now? Do you believe it, or do you but think... he would have woken up when he's ready to wake up. He's tired. He worked hard. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's probably the best answer right there. Yeah. yeah. You don't... Yeah. If, that's one of the misconceptions we're going to go over. You don't get stuck in hypnosis. If you're really tired, you might fall asleep. Yeah. And if you're extremely tired, it might take a while for you to wake up. But when you're rested, you wake up. Yeah, that's a misconception. Yeah, I've hours before. Oh, me too. I've done more than that, I think, at times more. Okay, so so yeah, so there some of them will be challenging, like that would be challenging. But you had a good answer for it right there. Yeah, they would have woke up, no, you know, if you just would have let them rest. He needed the sleep, you know, something like that. But that is a misconception. Okay, uh, the first one, the the first one, because people think hypnosis is sleep. Remember, it came from the Greek word for sleep, and that kind of started the misconception. And all the stage hypnotists sleep. <laughs> you know, they do all the you know. The sleep thing is out there still. I don't care for that style of putting people into hypnosis. And I, I really tend to, for my style, I tend to avoid the word sleep. And if I do use it, I, I kind of, you know, couch it with the explanation that, you know, I may say the word sleep to you, or even when I'm induce, you know, doing the induction, I might use that. Um, and you're going to be just as relaxed almost as if you're, you're, you know, just like at night when you fall asleep, although you're, you're, you'll be very, very alert and clear and awake here in, at an unconscious level, even if your conscious mind doesn't hear what I say I, or something. I, you know. yeah. I do use the word sleep, mm -hmm. but I, it, it's in it that, that, that you know, as you become more and more relaxed and more and more focused, <coughs> and you go deeper and deeper, that you'll be, be so deep and so alert that you will not fall asleep. So you're giving them a suggestion not to fall asleep, yeah, which we prefer them not to do, and obviously. And since I've done that, yeah. fall good. asleep. Good. So you found some nice wording deep, there. Deeper and deeper. Good, good. And I yeah. don't actually word it quite that way. Yeah, exactly. and I don't word it the way I said either. But a little yeah. more subtle than that. Sure, yeah. and for each person. But, but the main thing is I don't want them to think that hypnosis is sleep. It is a misconception that I, that if they have that impression or that's one of the things you can explain to people. Because you're going to be going through a whole list of misconceptions with your practice clients. Just so you can get used to how to answer these things. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, they, that's why I like bringing in people from the outside for you to practice with. 
because every once in a while they come up with something that nobody else thought of and it's like oh that's interesting let's mark that one down for practice for next time you know to consider how would you answer that that's a new one. like the one ones you offered are different than I'm used to hearing you know and these days by the way a lot less people have misconceptions about hypnosis I noticed some of them have a little bit of strange ideas about it uh, mostly about not being you know about losing control and those kind of things which we'll get into but sleep is something you want to clear up it's not sleep like like the way you think of sleep at night when you're fully asleep although your body may be just as relaxed you know you embed some suggestions that it may feel as if you've fallen asleep because some people will come out of hypnosis and they'll go so deep that they'll say I fell asleep and you want to be ready for that so I clear that up in the beginning so I can bring it up again later when they say it anyway, because they're going to say it even if you b clear it. But I say, you know, even though you may feel as relaxed as when you're asleep, and you may, you may, your conscious mind may drift off, and it may seem like you were asleep, your unconscious mind will be very alert and hear everything I say, even if you don't remember it. So sleep, it's neither sleep or unconscious, even though I tend to use the word unconscious mind. And a lot of the literature calls it subconscious mind. That's the way I was trained, and I did that for many years. I just have a new habit. And how but about the idea of superconscious. Superconscious, uh, and that's in some of the literature. There, some pl some books have like five layers: conscious, unconscious, and they have jobs the unconscious does. Then they go to subconscious, and there's certain things that part of your mind does. And then they go to superconscious, and some of them have four or five layers like that. I just, in here, for purposes of in here, I just keep it, and we'll talk about the different levels of how some people label them, but in here I talk about conscious being what you're aware of right now, consciously, and all the rest is unconscious, or subconscious on some of the scripts. All the rest is unconscious or subconscious. Superconscious, I think of that as a way of talking about the unconscious, the higher faculties, the higher consciousness, the higher intelligence, you know, all those things to me represent that place where we're, all our stuff isn't in the way, you know, kind of that pure place where you can really see things the way they can be, the way they can be, okay? So it's not sleep. Um, it's a common misconception that you're asleep when you're hypnotized because they've seen movies or they've seen, you know, something like that. Uh, the experience of a formally induced hypnosis state might resemble sleep from the physical point of view. Again, they might feel as if they're falling asleep because they're so relaxed. Uh, their breathing slows down, their eyes close, their muscles get relaxed. Um, from a mental standpoint though, they're clear and, re and, and alert. They're, they're relaxed physically but alert at an unconscious level more so because you're quieting that clutter, of that busy mind, the, the logical part of the mind. So that's one, you can use some of those things to explain that to somebody. Uh, the client can think, they can talk, they can respond through idiomotor movements. Um, they can move about if they need to. And I always tell people if you need to reposition or if you need to get a drink of water, I've had people who have coughing fits in hypnosis. I always turn that into your body's releasing something it didn't need. Take a drink of water and we'll go right back. I always turn everything into, whatever happens is, you'll hear me say this a lot in here, whatever the client does is perfect. And if you can really fool your, trick yourself or fool yourself or pretend or imagine or act or whatever you got to do to keep that attitude, guess what happens? I'll tell you from experience, it turns out great. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to start all over again this session. Well, if they come up, then you want to put them back. But they'll go back real fast because we're going to actually learn some techniques on how to bring people out and put them right back. It's called fractionation. That's an advanced technique. Yeah, you just put them right back. So if they wake up or if something gets their attention or if they get, have a coughing fit, I just get real quiet until they're finished. I say, you want to take a drink of water? It's, it's okay, everything's fine. And then when they're done, I'll say, I usually try to reframe it into something. I, I just assume something was happening, that they tapped into something and then they're released. And I don't know that that's not true, by the way. Mm -hmm. But if it isn't true, at least it lets them know this is okay, everything's fine. And then I'll say, now just go right back. I'll say this is actually a technique I see I can use things like my classes now so I use different examples these days but I'll say you know in class we actually teach the students that if somebody's you know somebody has uh, difficulty getting into a state of hypnosis and you didn't have any difficulty at all when you went in but if people do that we actually teach them a technique where they make them come out of hypnosis for a few seconds then put them back and then bring them out again and put them back I'll say that's actually a technique to allow you to go even 
deeper now. So now when she goes back, she, oh, this is a technique. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go, just assuming I'm going to go deeper now, because she teaches this to her class, you know, so you can say things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that when you come out, it's your body taking care of something, or releasing something, if it's a, something like that, I'll usually use that, and I think, because people do have things happen in hypnosis, and they'll go, wow, I never do that, and well, that's your mind releasing something or shifting mm -hmm. shifting something might be another way I say it yeah I always turn it into I always assume it's perfect and it's something's happening t in line with what they're there for and if you keep that energy it's amazing how everything does seem to end up that way <laughs> so whatever the client does is perfect but it's not sleep um, you can think talk respond through idiomotor response um, measured on an uh, electro encephalogram easy for me to say, EEG, biofeedback, which I took that training because uh, years ago in California because I wanted to find out about the brain waves. I was curious because in the hypnosis classes they're always talking about brain waves. So I took a, tra a weekend training in EEG biofeedback. It was, I don't have time to go into it too much detail here, but it was one of the most uh, eye-opening and uh, interesting classes I've ever taken because they were literally giving people migraines using the biofeedback machines that were fine before. I said, what are we doing here? We're really playing with people's heads. And I had an episode in my sleep that scared me. <laughs> so I'm not so sure about that. But, but, you know, hypnosis is biofeedback without the machine. You know, we're kind of the biofeedback machine. We're sensing what's going on and we're feeding it back to the client in a way that'll help them to get what they want. So you think of it like that. But it's not sleep. And, uh, but anyway, on the EEG, uh, the brain waves usually show alpha that's the next level. We're going to go into the brain waves a little bit more later. But you got beta is full waking consciousness, whatever that means, which we're in very small amount of the day. And light alpha state is where we are a lot of the day, most of the day. But that's the beginning stages of going into hypnosis is a light alpha state. And we'll talk about the changes that occur in all those. But on the EEG, uh, shows slowed alpha and beta ranges, uh, both indicating consciousness but since hypnosis is not deep sleep, we're talking about people that use things like sleep deeply or go deeper to sleep. That's not really an accurate way to say what's happening with them. That's why we, some people tend to stay away from those words, but it's used a lot still in hypnosis. And as long as the, the client gets the result and they understand what's going on, I don't, I don't think, it doesn't get in the way for the people that, that feel comfortable using it. It's more about your comfort level with what you do. And like I said, it's just something I, I tended not to get in the habit of saying. So, uh, so it's not sleep. Uh, only weak-willed people can be hypnotized. That's a pretty common misconception, maybe not as much now, but uh, through the years, you know, because they see movies where someone gets under the control of someone else by the person hypnotizing them. So it means your will is weaker than the other, you're weaker than them. That's a total misconception. Uh, so, since most people do enter trance spontaneously throughout the day, which is part of the, the way that you can explain this, if they say, you know, only weak-willed people can be hypnotized, um, Highway hypnosis is one thing, you know, in the pre-talk a lot of times we'll talk about different ways to explain hypnosis mm -hmm. and we'll get into talking about driving, watching a movie, different things that you do where you go into alpha, which in our world, for our purposes, is a light hypnotic brainwave state when you're talking brainwaves. So you want to let them know that um, you go, first of all, everybody goes in and out of hypnosis all the time. And studies do show that, that the people that are more intelligent make the best hypnotic subjects. And they always go, really? Every single time they're gonna say, really? Now, when you, and it is true by the way, but when you say that to somebody, nobody thinks they're stupid. <laughs> you know, if you say, everybody in here that's, that's intelligent, raise your hand, everybody's gonna raise your hand in a group. So if you tell your client that the more intelligent people make even better hypnotic subjects, you've just done that, haven't you? You've allowed them to, oh, well, I'm smart, so I should be good at this. So that's, that's the way you clear that up, or one of the ways. Uh, I have a question about that, though. Yeah, if yeah. You're telling, I mean, you know, yes, innately people think they're very intelligent, but what happens if they are, if they don't um, go under, okay? And then they're under what? Under hypnosis, and they're going to think, well, what? I'm not smart enough to go under hypnosis because well, the... Well, what would be the reason why somebody wouldn't go? I don't know. Into hypnosis. Right, exactly. I like that word better. Exactly. But I mean, sometimes, yeah. I mean, and maybe that's another misconception. That well, let's say they came in. Let's right. use that scenario. Right. They come in and they say, 
You know, I, someone tried to hypnotize me. I get this a lot. Somebody tried to hypnotize me. I've been, people have tried to hypnotize me. Sometimes they have a whole group that's tried to hypnotize me. And they'll say, and I, I just can't be hypnotized because I'm just too strong-willed. And I'll say, that's interesting. Now let me go through what this says about that. I'm too strong-willed to be hypnotized is one of these. It indicates a person who might resist, right? If they think being strong-willed is, 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 means they can't be hypnotized, they're going to be resisting it. So reassuring the person that uh, they'll be successful uh, if, and they, that they can choose to resist if they want to. Mm -hmm. And what I, here's what, I'm not even going to look at this. What I usually tell people is I, I would say, well, first of all, if people tried to hypnotize you, that was the first mistake. <laughs> and then I do my whole try thing. Because, you know, when you try to do something, it implies two things. It implies it's going to take effort, and it implies, implies the possibility of failure. So when, I, when you work with me, and if you, want me, if you want me to hypnotize you, and I get the contract, we'll talk about that later, then we're not going to try. We're just going to do it. Yeah, and, and I can assure you that people that are the stronger willed, the strong minded, the really uh, powerful people, intelligent people make the absolute best hypnotic subjects because they know what they want, mm -hmm. they know that they have everything inside of them to get it, and they can follow instructions very efficiently. So th at that point then you've really got to get the rapport before you start the induction. And you might, there's a lot of things you're going to have that you can do for people like that, that, and I won't call them tricks, but some books do, <laughs> you know, that you can get them, you can, you can get them to have to admit that they're good at this. And the main part of it is putting it on them, though. That's the other thing. I'm not going to try to hypnotize you, you know. People say that out at events all the time. I'm sure you get this all the time. You know, say, oh, you're going to hypnotize me? I say, do you want to be hypnotized? No. Well, I'm not. Why would I do that? You know, you have to hypnotize yourself. I'm, I'm just a guide. You tell me what you want, I help you find it inside of yourself. That's all. You know, so, so there's ways, depending on their attitude, too, you can say different things different ways. I, I can get pretty flippant if somebody's really being ridiculous about it. You know, I've got my little answers through the years but most people just if they really believe that you know them being strong-willed is gonna make it harder for them to get hypnotized you got to clear that mm -hmm. and be hundred percent congruent about your belief because it is true that you know the, the, the stronger willed people they're people that really can get things done they're people that really once they put their mind to something and you're telling me you really want this and you're really you're adamant that this is what you want but you're still not getting it so that tells me you've got something at the unconscious level that's been programmed in that isn't the real you it's like it's it's, it's against your nature maybe it got in there when you were two I don't know but whatever part of you is not letting you get this thing that you know you want and you need and you can get that's the part of you that we're going to be talking to and make sure that it understands how strong you are and how much you want this and that kind of thing. I don't know, whatever, whatever it takes. But you want to really get them to know that inside of them is going to be the ability to shift that, you know, that thing. Because strong-willed people don't want to admit they're wrong. They don't want to admit they're, they have problems. They don't want to admit that they have fears or doubts, and they do. They're just too strong-willed to, ex you know, admit it or accept it, maybe even to themselves. But in hypnosis, those are the people, I'll tell you, in my experience, the people that have really broken down and cried the most have been the ones that walked in. I'm A-type personality, I'm in control. You know, they're the ones that will be blubbering babies in the session. And they won't be embarrassed, by the way. When that happens, they are not embarrassed. They are relieved. Right, because there's a lot of pent-up. If, you, if they feel safe with you. And that's your job in the pre-talk, mm -hmm. to and get them to feel safe. Time, I think people tend when I run up, I sort of feel a little bit arrogant. Sometimes people are outwardly arrogant towards you, even though you weren't addressing them. Mm -hmm. And it almost seems as though they have some insecurities. Oh, absolutely. That, that, yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, that bullies are the most, I feel sorry for bullies. They're the most insecure people in the universe. Yeah. And a verbal bully is the same thing. They've they got that shield up because they're and covering the up. Yeah, everybody has their things. And, and again, if somebody comes to you and they have some of these things, we know how to see through it. We don't see the arrogance, do we? Yeah. We see that scared little boy inside that's, yeah. you know, needing some something yeah, or whatever it is. Exactly. And that's, and that's the thing, you know, because people, they have their defense mechanisms. We all do. 
we all develop up to this point in our life, we have certain things that have worked that we're going to keep doing until they don't work anymore or until we find a better way to do it, right? Uh, back in the old days, they had uh, from, the, from the old EST training, Werner Erhard, you all remember that back in the, I guess it was back in the 50s or 60s. It was kind of wild stuff, but there was an offshoot of EST training. I had read those books back in, when I was in the band, and I was, it was fascinating to me. They used to lock people in these big rooms, you know, hundreds of people in a room, and they wouldn't let them go to the bathroom, and they wouldn't let them take aspirin. They wouldn't, and they'd just make them sit in this room. It was a really strange, but it was, it was very great mind stuff. But I, I went to a weekend of an offshoot of that as I was getting divorced from my second husband and needed something. So that showed up. And I, I went to this training. It was really cool. It was a lot of NLP and hypnosis and stuff. But, it, but it, not, they didn't call it that. But it was, it was about the mind and how you think about things, how you perceive things. And what they called are things that we use to, to function in our life. They called them rackets and winning formulas. I remember, I remember that still to this day. I had a great, the guy was great. I loved him. He was real obnoxious. He would yell at people. He'd cuss at people. But he was really good at getting through their stuff. He wouldn't let people get away with their excuses and all their stuff. And that's what the training was about. You'd break them down to say, you know, you know to get to the truth which, that's underneath all of that, all their rackets and winning formulas. Break through those and you see that real person and what, what's really going on. And people that are abrupt or bullies or or arrogant, that's their racket. That has worked for them. I have a stepfather who's a good example of that. And I've always, I was, for some reason, I must have had some perceptions of this stuff all my life because I was the first one out of his four kids and, and my mom's three that ever broke him, got him to the point where he'd say, I love you. Because I knew underneath all that brash, disgusting jerk outside, this isn't going to be seen by him, hopefully, <laughs> was a soft, a very soft, vulnerable underbelly that needed all that protection. And he was an orphan and he had some things in his past that kind of even logically from a, if I was a psychologist, I would say, oh yeah, you know, you were abandoned and you had this and that and whatever. But that's irrelevant to us. If it comes up, if they know it, if, if, if they know it and it comes up, then we know, well, that adds to their reasons why they think they need to be this way maybe. But, but you know, it's, it's, it's seeing that person be in the inner person behind that exterior like you said and that's it's it's nice to do that with people because we all have bad days and some of us have a lot of bad days and some of us <coughs> build up build up a, a harsh exterior to try to protect ourselves from having any more bad days you know and everybody has their different defense mechanisms but that was an, that was a really cool class uh, the racket was you know how you get people to do what you want your winning formulas you know same thing, really. They're both the same thing, kind of, yeah. But it was really cool, you know. And we develop these. This is how humans develop their personalities. When you're a little kid, you figure out what you can get away with, right? You figure out what gets you what you want. You know, it's very simple terms, you know. And you try to avoid the things that get you what you don't want. <laughs> and we still do that, by the way. <laughs> you know, no matter how old we get, we still have that those, those strategies. And by the way, some of the ones we developed back then aren't working anymore. And that's where we can help people. We, they can get a better, more intelligent uh, strategy, a and more a more like experienced a strategy. Kids, you know, they get to the point where they have their strategies, but then they hit 18, and it's like, well, listen, nobody cares how cute yeah, yeah. you are anymore. You're an adult. And yeah. Oh, here, here's, a, here's a good story, too. Uh, Dan told me a story. I don't know why this popped in my head, but it's about, about kids. I don't, I don't generally work with small children, and I've never had kids, so I haven't got a lot of personal experience of stories about them other than other people's and my niece and nephews and stuff. But uh, Dan, uh, my husband, never had kids either, but when he was married the first time out of college, he tells a story about going to a friend's house. Him and his wife went to some friend's house, and I think they were in Phoenix, Arizona somewhere. And their friends had a couple of kids, and, and they were not very well behaved. They weren't, you know, and I never, I never blame it on the kids, by the way, when I see kids that aren't well behaved. It's because they do what they can get away with, right? But this one little, little kid, I forget how old he said it was, a small two or three year old or whatever, four, and would scream and cry and throw fits all the time and just holler and scream. Now, Dan and his wife didn't have any children, and they didn't really necessarily want to be around a screaming child. So he was, Dan was in the living room at one point, he said, and the kid, the kid uh, came in there and he banged his toe, or, or he was in some room by himself for some reason, and the kid came running in and banged his toe on something. 
and just laid down on the floor and started screaming and crying and screaming. And Dan just stood there and looked at him. And he said the kid just stopped and looked at him and he started screaming louder and crying louder. And Dan just sat there, stood there and smiled at him. And I forget if he says he said something like, you don't expect me to do anything, do you? And the kid stood up, stopped crying, straight as he could be, ran in the next room, and then he could hear him in there screaming and crying and the mother coming on and taking care of it, right? Just completely. So that was his strategy, but it wasn't working with Dan, so he had to go where it would work, right? But that's an, exa that's an example. We do that, don't we? You know, we have our w things that seem to work, but if we get in a context where it's not working, we can really have a, a bad experience. You know, if we've been uh, speaking to groups um, that, that, you know, someplace maybe where we've had good responses from people and then all of a sudden we go somewhere else and we give a talk and we get a very cold reception, that can be traumatic. That can cause someone to all of a sudden have anxiety about speaking, just that one event, you know, because it wasn't the experience they'd been having. And those are all just normal uh, human things that happen that we can work through in a healthy way <laughs> with some of these kinds of techniques, or they can head to the doctor and start taking pills and have 10 more problems down the road. Not that I don't believe in pills. I think they're great temporary fixes. That's what they're meant to be. Okay, so let's get back to the misconceptions. So weak-willed people, you can clear that up easily. Uh, and then the next one is just like that, weak-minded people, no. The stronger minded you are, the better you're going to be at this. The, the more uh, efficiently your mind works, the, you know, the easier it's going to follow instructions and, and give you what you want. Okay? Uh, others can be hypnotized, but not me. That's back to that thing of, I don't think I can be hypnotized. People have tried to hypnotize me. And, and again, I just, uh, what I, and I, I, this might be a little rude. But I, I sometimes do this. I say, well, that tells me that, number one, either you really didn't want to, it wasn't important to you enough that, to cooperate, or they weren't very good hypnotists. Now, that's not very nice, but there's an implication in that, isn't it? And there, you have to be confident to say something like that, which I am. And, and what, what I want them to know is I am a good hypnotist. And if you want to be, that's the other part of it, you've got to want to do it. And then after the pre-talk, they get that this isn't about me. I've got all my experience and training. This is about you. Let's get clear on what you want and trust, you know, get the rapport enough where they have confidence that I can help them figure it out. Because if their conscious, logical mind could have figured it out, like I keep saying, it would have already done it. They wouldn't need to come see you. If they're that strong-willed, that's great. That means there's something at the unconscious level. And your strong will will help you get it as soon as we figure out what that unconscious part of your mind that's more powerful is fighting against you with and we can get that message in there and, and clear it up and get it on board then you got everything going in the same direction there's no more fight okay so uh, everyone can be hypnotized uh, I have a sheet that I give to my clients if they really have a, a question about that I'll bring it in in one of the classes it's a it's a little write-up I have that's um, it was written up in Psychology Today, but it was uh, a lot of the pieces on there were from a presentation at the American Psychological Association. Okay, now if I give her, if I give some people something from a hypnosis journal, it might have some credibility, but for most people in this culture, if you bring it in from the Psychological Association, now they know that's got something to do with real research and all that stuff. At least at this point in time. So uh, on there. It has a, a statement on there, even from the AMA, they admit that most people can be hypnotized, almost anybody can be hypnotized. And the, I forget what the exact statement is, but I'll bring that in sometime. And, that, and I think they even put a percent on it, which is impossible to know. That percent just means the rest of them didn't have a good hypnotist to work with or didn't want it bad enough or something, you know, in my mind. But I, what I tell people is everyone can be hypnotized. Because we go in, and then we're doing the talk about, we go in and out of hypnosis, and we prove it to them by finding some things they can say, oh yeah, I do that, you know, and then you say, see? And, and I talk about brain waves if I have to, and we'll talk about some more of that if you need it. And, but I say, you know, everybody can be hypnotized, and the only people, that, if there is anyone that couldn't be, it would just be someone who either uh, is, has such a, a brain defect that they can't even follow instructions, you know, or 
whatever. And I'm not even sure in that case that I know, but I'll tell them that, you know, like a, like a severe brain injury where they can't even hear you to, to follow what you're saying, or possibly a small child that you just, you know, can't get their attention, that they don't want to be hypnotized and they're just running around, you can't get their attention.